choir. Let's pray together. Father, it's been good to be in your house to sing the hymns of praise, to rest under the words of Scripture, to hear your voice through the choir, to sing hymns and to experience when those words turn around and they're being sung to us instead of us singing to you. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Father, we gather here this morning because we believe that you are the creator, sustainer, king, judge, ruler of the universe. We're also deeply moved by the fact that you love us, that you know each one of us by name, and that because of your great love for us, you became sin for us so that we might have eternal life. And beyond that, you know our lives intimately. You know who of us in this room are here today and filled with the exceedingly great joy and the others who barely limped in this morning because their hearts are filled with sadness. We thank you for, for that knowledge, for that depth of love. And Father, as we still our hearts under your word, we trust during this time that you will speak into us the words that that our soul, whether we need encouragement, direction, admonishment, instruction, direction, wisdom, because you love us and know us and see us, that you'll speak. To that end, Father, we give you our ear, give you our soul, and we ask that you'd speak. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. If you'll join us in Mark chapter 2. As we make our way through the Gospel of Mark at a ripping pace, we started in November, here we are in chapter 2. Someone asked me, I think tongue-in-cheek, maybe not perhaps, but uh, why are we spending so much time in Mark? I guess the answer to that is because we claim to be Christ followers and we understand that our primary description is that we are to be Christ-like. And if that be the case, then we should spend a good deal of time of examining what it means to be like Christ. Who is Christ? What was his perspective on life? How did he go through life? And so we slow down and we read about our Lord and Savior. Today we read a story from Luke chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me, and he rose and followed him. Now, just a few observations there. If you read this story in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew identifies the name of this individual as Matthew. The rest of the story is almost word for word. So we're left with the question, is Matthew and Levi the same person, or is this a third another tax collector. Jesus has quite interaction with tax collectors. You remember Zacchaeus, who was the chief tax collector? And it seems to be his M.O. that he would meet them and then have a dinner at their house. So whether Matthew and Levi are the same person or we now have three tax collectors, most people seem to identify that Matthew and Levi are, are the same person here. Uh, and, of course, you know tax collectors in this day and age were not exactly of high regard. A couple reasons for that. The Romans were seen as the occupying foreign force in Judea. And so when a Jew would go to work for the Romans collecting taxes to them, they were seen as the one who was betraying their people. Uh, worse than that, though, the whole Roman system of taxation was, uh, was ripe for corruption. They were tasked with collecting X amount of taxes. Whatever they could get above that, they got to keep. So you knew you were being cheated. You just didn't know how much you were being cheated. Now add that with the fact that we were seen as a betrayer and that was not a very high reputation job. However, it was a very lucrative position. Well sought out positions. People paid bribes to become tax collectors. And Jesus just walks up to Levi and says, follow me. We're not told whether Levi had met Jesus before, whether he had been at Simon Peter's house and, and watched all of the people getting healed, or whether he had been at the house earlier where the, the paralytic was brought and he heard Jesus preach the word, or if he even one verse earlier heard Jesus teaching them. We're not told all that. We're just told that Jesus looks at the man and says, You follow me. And we find that kind of hard to believe that Levi might leave everything and follow Jesus. But how many of you have the faith story today? 
where God reached into your soul and grabbed you with very little background, and your life was changed. Interactions with God can happen like that. And immediately what happens is Levi takes Jesus to his house and throws a party. And so as he reclined at the table in his house, as Jesus reclined at the table in Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. One article I read this week said that the the typical position to eat a meal would be sitting at a table. But if you were going to throw a banquet where you wanted to invite people over to stay for a while and you wanted people to conversate and hang out, that's when you do the more reclining method with the low table and the pillows. And so the idea that Jesus is reclining here is he did not just come in to have a quick taco on his way out. This was a party that Levi had thrown and said, I want my friends to meet you and your friends. Levi was maximizing his relationship, saying, I want you to meet this Jesus who has radically changed my life. You notice this phrase three times in the next few verses we read, tax collectors and sinners. Every culture has a phrase to describe the, uh, the undesirables, the riffraff. Did you know riffraff is actually a word? I looked it up in the dictionary. It's actually a real word. It means the undesirables. And every culture kind of has that description. And for this culture, it was tax collectors, for obvious reasons, but sinners. And sinners were seen by the religious leaders as those people who would not submit to our interpretation, application of the law. If you weren't living life the way we say you should live life, you were a sinner. And these were the people, Levi's group, that he brought and said, I want you to meet this guy who changed my life. Many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, and there were many. Up until this point in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus has not called out the twelve from among his disciples. It's just this group following Jesus. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. I think that last phrase is a little bit tongue-in-cheek. Jesus is not calling the Levites, uh, uh, not calling the Pharisees, the scribes, righteous. We see through the rest of the gospel, he sees them to be self-righteous, convinced of their own righteousness. So a little tongue-in-cheek sarcasm there. But this beautiful phrase that he gives to us, the idea of the sick need a doctor. And we're going to camp out on that for a while. But I want us to read this story today through this very specific lens. How is it that followers of Jesus, how are we supposed to relate to people who are not followers of Jesus? How do believers of Jesus relate to unbelievers of Jesus? Because in this story, we have two very distinct ways of answering that question. We have the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the other religious leaders. They have a way of answering that question. This is how we are to relate to people who are not of faith. And Jesus and Levi have a very different way of answering that question. So I want us to compare and contrast these two. But before we do that, we really need to slow down a little bit with the Pharisees. I mean, the Pharisees were so accustomed to reading the Scriptures, and the Pharisees are the bad guys. You know, it's like they're the, the Sith Lords that walk into the stage. You, know, you almost hear the music, bum, 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 bum. You know, the, the, the dark people walk on, they're the bad guys. But you need to know a little bit of the history of the Pharisees. The Pharisees originated several hundred years before Christ was born. And what had happened in Judea is as Greek, as the Greeks pretty much captured the known world and the Mediterranean world, and that included Judea and Jerusalem, they were trying to push their culture upon all the lands that they conquered. They wanted everything to be Greece, and so they pushed their language, and they pushed their education system, and their politics, and their culture, and everything, but what's also included their paganism, their religion. And so what had happened in Judea is the Greek paganism and the worship of Yahweh were beginning to meld together into this blob of kind of religious something. And, and there was a group of Jews who became very worried about that, saying we're, we're losing what it means to be followers of Yahweh and faithful to the law, and we need to separate away from this Greek paganism and be pure worshipers of Yahweh. And this group that was so passionate about that became known by the Hebrew word to separate 
which is parush, and eventually became known by the Greek word, which is the root word for Pharisee. See, the root of the Pharisees were a group of people who were concerned that worship of Yahweh was being so mixed with Greek paganism that it was no longer really true worship of Yahweh, so they had to separate from that. The problem is, by the hundreds of years by the time Christ showed up, they had taken the law of Moses, and because they were trying to identify what it means to live purely according to the law, they had come up with so many specific applications of the law, and in their mind, the applications of the law were really just as authoritative, if not more, than the law itself best example of this and you've heard this before i'm sure they took the same single law remember the sabbath and keep it holy today the day of rest do no work they had taken that one commandment and had developed all of these laws 39 different categories of what it meant to do no work on the sabbath carrying everything from categories of carrying burning extinguishing writing erasing cooking washing sewing tearing knotting untying plowing planting reaping threshing sifting grinding kneading dying weaving and building all of these categories they had identified if you had a sheet of paper on the table and you had a pencil on top of the sheet of paper on your table is it work to move that pencil they had an answer for that question They had taken that one law and they had applied it so specifically and make no mistake, those applications were every bit as authoritative as the law itself. So the Pharisees had become by the time Jesus shows up. And so you see them here, they're shadowing Jesus around now. They're watching everything that he's doing. And here it is, they find him having table fellowship sinners table fellowship was a big deal in this culture who you ate with there were so many rules around how to host a meal and where people sat and where they're supposed to give them water when they showed up to your house so they could wash their feet and what you fed them and who you had to give another invitation back to because they invited you to their feast there were so many rules around this and jesus was breaking about 712 of them you know in that moment what he was doing and they were just what is he doing eating with tax collectors and sinners And Jesus gives this beautiful phrase. Sick people need a doctor. You know, this question of how do believers relate to unbelievers, this is not a really a question of Scripture. It's a very real question, isn't it? If you're a middle school student and you're trying to be a follower of Jesus in middle school, this question is alive and well. How do I relate to other middle school students who do not want to be a follower of Jesus. If you're a high school student, this is a very real question. If you're a college student, if, if you have a job somewhere where you, you know, unless you're a monk, if you've got a job somewhere, you actually have other people you work with, this question is very real. As a follower of Jesus, surrounded by people who do not want to follow Jesus, how do I relate to them? And the Pharisees have a very specific way of answering that question, and Jesus has a very different way of answering that question. For instance, notice just the very basic viewpoint between the difference between the Pharisees and Jesus and Levi. Pharisees looked at these tax collectors and, and sinners basically as criminals to be judged. They were guilty of breaking a law. They need to be judged as lawbreakers. They need to be identified as lawbreakers. They need to be punished as lawbreakers. We sit here with the law. They've broken it. They're criminals to be punished, to be judged. Whereas Jesus and Levi and his followers had a completely different paradigm to look at the situation. From their perspective, what they saw was a sick person with a disease who needs healing. Now, theologically, of course, we understand the disease is sin. Scripture tells us that we're dead in our sins. And because we are dead in our sins and our trespasses, we are alienated from God. And because of that, we are carrying out the disease, uh, the deeds of the flesh. But the disease at the heart of the problem is that we are sinners who are dead in our sin. And Jesus looked at these people and they, he saw people who were sick with the disease of sin. Now that's a very different way of looking at the very same people. Because if you're a Pharisee, and you look at them and you see this is a criminal that needs to be judged and punished. What's the solution? Well, you 
exile them. You send them away. You, you issue a punishment. You declare what needs to be done to chastise these people. But if you come from a healing profession and you see someone who's sick and who has a disease, what's the solution? You bring them to one who can heal. Two different reactions to the very same people. That's why Levi did what he did. I have friends who are sick. So what do you do with that? Well, you introduce them to Jesus. So you throw a party. Y'all come. Jesus, come. This is the, the healer. Two different perspectives. Notice that the Pharisees have, have no compassion. They're tax collectors and sinners. I mean, pretty good sign that you don't have any compassion is you use labels. You know, whenever you start using them language, you know, in the deep south, them, their people, when you start talking like that, that illustrates you're not having compassion for them. Okay? Those in the healing profession don't use the them people kind of language. They see individuals, individuals who have a, who have a sickness that has invaded the body, who, who, who want to be a part of healing. Those who are of the healing profession. Understand that if you're going to bring healing to someone who's sick, you're going to have to have contact with them. You know, WebMD is great. Have you all gone to WebMD and, and diagnosed yourself? And you go through the little questions, what part of your body hurts, does this? Do. At the bottom, you always end up with you're going to die, be die, you know, dead by Thursday kind of deal. It's, uh, and doctors and, and nurses and those in the healing profession understand, you know, WebMD may be, may be good for information, but if you're really going to bring healing, you're going to have to have contact with the person who's sick. You're going to have to breathe the same air. You're going to actually have to touch them. You have to have interaction with them. You have to sit in a room and say, tell me what's the problem. Pharisees don't want to have any interaction, any contact. They don't need interaction. I've got the facts. You were driving 80 in a 55. Your blood alcohol content was this. Therefore, you're guilty. Punish sends you away. I don't need interaction with you if that's your perspective. But those from the healing profession know if you want to help someone find healing, you have to have interaction. You have to have contact. Notice that those in the healing profession, using the analogy, they understand the difference between symptoms and diseases. Uh, Pharisees just focus on the symptoms, and, but folks from the healing profession understand the difference between that. If you come to someone, come to your doctor and, and you're your, up, your stomach is upset and you're vomiting. Yes, the doctor is going to try to give you something to ease your stomach, but the bigger question is, why? I mean, if you've got some kind of stomach cancer or something that's causing that, it's not really loving for me just to give you some Pepto-Bisbo and solve that problem. If I'm going to bring healing to your life, we have to say, what's the root cause? And Jesus knows the root cause is the sin nature. You're dead in your sins. You need forgiveness. You need a redeemer. You need redemption. You need new life. That's what brings healing. Whereas Pharisees just look at the symptoms. You live a sinful life. Well, why do they live a sinful life? Because they're dead in their sins. How is that going to change? Because they meet the healing power of Jesus. That those in the healing profession also understand that while they agree if you're going to bring healing, you have to have contact and interaction and relationship with the sick, you also have to protect yourself against the illness. Uh, which is why when you go see a doctor and they walk in the room, you know, one of the first things they do is they, they put on the gloves or whatever you may have. They may have the mask. There's, there's a protocol in the healing profession of how to make sure that the doctor or the nurse doesn't get sick with whatever you have. Because if I get sick with what you got, I can't really help you and bring healing to you and all the other people who may come to see me. So for me to be effective, I have to protect myself from the disease. And if we could bring a nurse or doctor up here and they could probably give us 20, 30, 40 things about the protocol about how you do that. The Pharisees had the same concern. We want to protect ourselves from the disease. So what do they do? No contact at all. Just you go away and we can be safe from the disease. See, two very different paradigms about how to relate to those who are unbelievers. 
in this great phrase that Jesus gives, sick people need physicians. So this morning I want to kind of boil all this down to four principles that, that God can speak into your life about what it means for you to relate to an unbeliever. And I'm, I'm hoping that, I'm praying that at this, as we talk about these principles, that what takes place in this moment is that the Spirit of God is really grabbing your heart with a specific name of a specific person. And that one of these will, will be captured, the Spirit will capture you with one of these. The first principle is this is to be a Christ follower, to be Christ-like, means that we share Jesus' view about those who are tax collectors and sinners. We see them as sick people who are in need of healing, which means that we have a compassion towards them. It means that we understand that, that they have a disease that needs healing from, and that disease is their sin nature. They're dead in their sins. That's why they live that way. That's why they are that way. That's why they have all these problems around their life is because they're running away from God, and we have a, a basic viewpoint of compassion that says we want that person to find healing. It is not Christ-like to have the basic viewpoint of the Pharisee that says to shun them, to judge them, to punish them, to have no compassion upon them. That's not to share the mind of Christ. Jesus was known through his life to be a friend of sinners. That was one of his biggest uh, knocks upon him. He kept eating with sinners. He kept eating with sinners. He kept hanging out with sinners. Why? Because he had compassion. And he wanted them to find healing. Second principle as we share the view of Jesus to be Christ-like, is our deep desire for these people that God is, is calling to our mind, these unbelievers that we share life with, our deep desire for them is that they find healing, and we understand that healing for them means that we are going to be used by God to connect them to Jesus. The way that they're going to find healing in life is that they are introduced to the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. It is to embrace this image of 2 Corinthians 5, and we read it this morning in our scripture reading, where we are ambassadors for Christ. God is making his appeal through us to other people that they can be reconciled to God. It is to see ourselves as a physician's assistant. We are the great physician's assistant in bringing healing to people, of trying to connect those who are sick with the healer Jesus himself. This is what Levi was trying to do. Throw a party, get my lost friends to meet Jesus. To be Christ-like means that we are assisting Christ in the healing process by connecting those who are sick with the great physician. Third principle that we need to wrestle with to share the mind of Christ is we have to realize that we don't bring healing by justifying the disease. Right? We are to be a friend of sinners, but not a friend of sin. So someone comes to a doctor and says, well, I have stomach cancer. And the doctor says, you have stomach cancer, but, you know, that's not a bad thing. So that's good. We don't want you to feel bad about that. We used to feel bad. We used to, you know, but we don't do that anymore. Embrace it. It's a good thing. That's not healing. It's healing for the doctor to say, yes, you have this cancer. And unless we get this out of your body, it is going to bring death. What did Jesus say to the woman who was caught in adultery? Where are those who condemn you? Neither do I. But go your way and sin no more. I am a friend of you, but I'm not a friend of adultery. I'm a friend of sinners, but I'm not a friend of sin. And I know that to bring healing in your life is to liberate you from the bondage to sin. That principle brings us to inherent conflict. What does it mean to be a friend of sinners and not to be a friend of sin? To be an ambassador for Christ and yet to, to avoid the very things that the people are involved in that we're being an ambassador to. It brings an inherent amount of conflict. We'll talk about that in a second. Fourth principle, just to let the Spirit light us up with today, is like all doctors know, that in trying to bring healing to those who are sick, Part of our key responsibility is to protect ourselves from the disease of sin. All through Scripture, we, we read things like James chapter 1, 
that our job is to keep ourselves unstained by the world. Or these words from Peter, from 1 Peter chapter 4. Live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, lawless idolatry. And with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. Our memory verse for this week, the very last phrase there in your bulletin, to avoid every form of evil. So this basic principle that says, yes, we are to have the, the view of Christ towards sinner, a view of compassion, a view that sees them as sick people who need healing, and the healing is from their sin nature, and the healer is Jesus Christ. And so my viewpoint there is to desire healing by connecting them with the, the great healer, the divine healer, Jesus himself. But at the same time, I have to protect myself from the disease of sin so that I don't become stained by the world or pulled back into sin. So we have these great tr truths in tension. We are to be a friend of sinners, but we are to not be corrupted by the world. It's a whole lot easier to be a Pharisee, isn't it? It's a whole lot easier just to go through life saying, I have very clear-cut rules, and I stay away from anyone who doesn't live by those same very rules, and I don't ever have to worry about the tension of what it looks like to be a friend of sinners, but not a friend of sin, of someone who wants to be in contact with sick people so they can introduce them to Jesus, but at the same time protects themselves so they don't get sick as well. It's a lot easier to be a Pharisee and to just avoid that tension. The problem is, it's not Christ-like. The model of Christ is to be a friend of sinners, just not to be a friend of sin. It's trickier to live by grace than it is to live by law. Which is why you have to have so much discernment guided by the Spirit to live with the view of Christ. There's so many variables at play that we constantly have to walk with the discernment of Jesus Christ. So our friend at work invites us over to their home to have a meal. Do we say yes? Does it matter if, if they're going to be drinking alcohol as the meal? Does it matter that they're going to be drinking a lot of alcohol with them? Does it matter really that it's a drinking party and not a meal? Does it matter that it's at a restaurant that has a bar? Or it's in the bar of a restaurant? Or it's just in a bar? Or it's in a bar with scantily clad waitresses? Or that it's a strip bar? A lot of variables at play. How mature am I in my faith? How strong am I? How, how easily tempted am I by a particular sin? I mean, I can be completely honest with you and say that if I were having dinner with someone who was drinking alcohol that, or getting drunk, and I, that would not lure me at all. That holds no temptation for me. And I don't say that because I'm some pious super saint. I'm just saying that doesn't push a button for me. But there are things that do push buttons. And I would say I could sit at that table and not be tempted at all, but if I were to sit at this table, I can't sit there. I know that about me. You have to, you have to answer that. What is my real motivation? Do I want to be a friend of sinners, or do I, in fact, really want to be a friend of sin? I just want to hide under this umbrella. I'm just trying to reach my friends for Jesus. But in reality, I get to engage in their sinful behavior and I get to kind of justify that. What's my real motivation? 